You've entered Bookstorm with Kristen Civiletto and me, Chris Storm. This is a podcast devoted to best-selling books that matter, books that make a difference. We're diving down deep with beloved authors about their stories. We're exposing hot-button topics and heartfelt themes, the issues that affect each of us in our own lives as siblings, parents, partners, friends, as human beings. We're braving new ideas, fresh thoughts, hard lessons and important truths. Those kinds of things that stay with us long after we turn the last page and close the book. Okay, well, listeners, welcome back. We are super excited to have the very talented Therese Ann Fowler with us today. We have been waiting for this interview for many months because we were thrilled to get the uh, advanced reader copy of her book that's coming out June 7th. Um, It all comes down to this. Let me tell you a little bit about Therese. There's the (laughs) book right there if you're watching us on YouTube. Beautiful cover. Therese is a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author. You will know her best from her other popular titles, Z, which was the story of Zelda Fitzgerald, the wife of F. Scott Fitzgerald, her her novel, A Well-Behaved Woman, and A Good Neighborhood. Her books are available in every format, in multiple languages. They're sold all around the world. In fact, Z, the Zelda Fitzgerald's uh, story, is uh, adapted for television by Amazon Studios, and you can view it currently. It's starring Christina Ricci as Zelda, and which we saw and loved, by the way. Absolutely. So Teresa earned a BA in Sociology and Cultural Anthropology and an MFA in Creative Writing from North Carolina State. Wow. She has been a visiting professor and occasionally teaches fiction writing at conferences all over. She is married to the award-winning professor and author John Kessel. They reside in North Carolina. Her books have won so many acclaims and awards, very well deserved and earned. I don't have time for all, but I want to name a few. (laughs) (laughs) New York Times, IndieBound, USA Today, LA Times, The Boston Globe, San Francisco Chronicle, Publishers Weekly. They have been featured in shows like in magazines like Oprah, Elle, People, The New York Times, USA Today, and The Wall Street Journal. Amazing. But as we said, we're here today to talk to her about the new novel that you are going to love called It All Comes Down to This. And I want to quote uh, Anne Napitalano, New York Times bestselling author of Dear Edward, says this book answered a need I didn't even know I had. She said it is entertaining in the best sense of the word and a true page turner. And Kristen and I felt the same way. It is uh, important, um, very profound, and even life-changing. Thank you for joining us, Therese. Oh my gosh. Well, I, I will come and talk to you every day if you're going to say <laughs> nice things like this about me. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. No, my head, do you see it swelling as you were speaking? It's wider. Well, Thanks, that. <laughs> well, you're, it's very well. It's I, I'm sure it's very hard earned, but it's also well deserved, and it's a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Teresa, we'd like to give our listeners a little bit of a background on the book. So if you'll indulge me, I'm going to go ahead and just talk briefly about uh, the factual happenings, but I'm not going to give away any spoilers. If you want to add anything at the end, by all means, do so. Um, This story follows three sisters in the aftermath of their mother's death. Now, their mother made a last request, and it's something that might change everything they know about their mother and themselves. Their mom, Marty, has stipulated in her will that their home, the summer home that they own on Mount Desert Island, Maine, should be sold as soon as possible. Now, this request is a bit of a shock to the three sisters for different reasons. Uh, Each of these sisters is holding a secret of their own. The eldest daughter, Beck, 
This cottage, as it's referred to, is essential to her future plans. She has a long-held desire to write, and she thinks that's important for her to be able to release all that creative energy. Claire, the other sister, is too preoccupied with her own post-divorce healing and other matters to even notice or care what happens. A third sister, Sophie, is reluctant to admit to her sisters, but she needs the financial uh, income to survive. And so we all have this backdrop coming together in this main cottage. Coming on the scene, we also have somebody who's just been released from prison, C.J. Reynolds, and he adds a whole layer of complication to the story. And as they all head towards Maine, we start to see events unfold and lives really change. Did you want to add anything to our little background? Oh, gosh, um, only that uh, Beck, who is the eldest sister, you described her as, as wanting to write. I should just clarify, she is a writer. She's a freelance journalist, but she wants to write fiction. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. So much great sexier, novel. right? <laughs> That's novel. right, the great American novel. <laughs> All right, well, let's let me get started with these characters. Uh, I want to start by saying I love the way you wrote these characters. For our readers, these are the kind, this is the kind of novel that you're going to open it up and you're going to feel like you understand these people. You're going to empathize with them, um, hurt with them, feel sorry with them. And I just loved every single one of these sisters, as different as they might be. Um, in fact, I actually thought to myself, as the reader, maybe at times we even knew them better than they knew themselves. Mm -hmm. There was one thing that the sisters had in common, and I s worded it as deception. They were not only deceiving themselves by trying to convince themselves they had happy lives, but they were de de deceiving the people that they were pretending or trying to love. They uh, each had somewhat of fractured relationships in the past. And that's something we can all relate to and empathize mm -hmm. with and sympathize with. I loved this one quote. The fact that she no longer trusted many things she'd once believed, including things she believed about herself. Yes, certain labels were unchangeable. And, and she was the eldest daughter, the sister, the mother, the grandmother. But was she really those things genuinely the version she'd once envisioned? No, she was not. And so my question to you as the writer is, did you plot these characters to evolve in this way or did they grow organically on their own? And also, this, um, this notion of remembering your original passion and trying to stay true to that, is it something that you may have dealt with? I always wonder when the writer, uh, describe such rich characters if you had experienced any of this in your own life? Yeah, okay, so the first part of that question was whether I sort of set out to deliberately create these characters who are sort of deceiving themselves about what is happening in their lives and, and how they relate to the other people in their lives. I think for a novel to be interesting, right, there has to be some kind of a problem that we have to, to work through um, and see resolved in for good or for ill. So of course that sort of just comes with the territory. If you're gonna write a story about, about messy families or dysfunctional families, that's kind of like the first ingredient, right? Um, the idea that, that all of these characters, the three sisters that you mentioned, um, also CJ, who you talked about in the intro, and then uh, the eldest sister's husband, Beck, they, the, those three sisters and, or Beck's hu husband, Paul, let's call him by his name, sorry. <laughs> they, they, these four characters really are the ones who are, are deceiving themselves, but they're also deceiving each other. And I think the most fun part of this book in terms of my crafting the story was in how to tell the story in a way that you, the reader, know the secrets that they are all keeping from each other. And then the fun is to sort of watch how the, the ultimate revelation is gonna occur and then what the consequences of that revelation or those revelations are going to be. So, you know, you're the fly on the wall in these, in these messy lives. 
as for, you know, do I relate to that? Do I draw from my own experience, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, yeah, it depends on how you look at it. Yes, um, I have in, in past versions of my own life um, been <laughs> sort of little pieces of each of these characters' lives are, are pieces that I could personally relate to. And this, the idea of self-deception, um, I think, it's something that everybody does experience at least at some stage in their lives. It can be career related, it can be relationship related, um, but I think it is uh, something that, that humans are just sort of prone to. And then the question is, you know, do you ever come to figure out why or what or why and can you change? And so that's what makes you know the the storyline of the novel. Can these people figure out what the heck they're doing? And then um, if they do figure it out, what will they do about it? Absolutely, I love as the reader when we see things and feel that we know more than the character and watch them discover something even in themselves. Yeah. And thank you for being so honest about this because the characters were so rich and I don't always ask a writer this question, but I thought the characters were so rich and deep that I thought you had to have in, in your past felt some of these emotions yourself in some way. And you're so correct with, I want to add two for our listeners. We all deal with this. It's not, this is what we love about fiction. It's not just these characters. We, we all deal with uh, convincing ourselves that this is where we always wanted to be, whether it's career-wise or relationship-wise or maybe where you live. And then, yeah. but then sometimes saying to ourselves, no, wait a minute, back up. Where did I get started and how did I get off course? And no, that's exactly right, yeah. I loved that you did that. And thank you for sharing. Thanks for sharing that. It was very profound. Yeah, we were talking, I want to pick up on that theme. We were talking about self-deception. And I was thinking about Sophie. She lives by the motto, fake it till you make it. And, yeah. I, <laughs> and that works for some people and works for her until it doesn't. Right. And, right. And I wanted to see if you could comment on that a little bit, because where do we draw the line between falsifying information or being very optimistic about where it is we want to go and allowing mm. others to fill in the blanks? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question, great observation. So, yes, so Sophie, you know, she is the youngest of the three sisters. She's uh, 36 years old when the book opens, and she is the most ambitious in terms of, of who she wants to be, ultimately. And, you know, so she's growing up in Manhattan, and being, you know, third in line in the family, she's sort of looking up at her bigger sisters who seem to her so accomplished and so, so pulled together that um, even from childhood, she's always sort of striving to be, I think I put it in, in the story at some point, the best possible Sophie, right? She always wants to be that best possible Sophie, but who is the best possible Sophie? And that ideal of who she is changes, you know, as she, as she makes her way through adulthood. But the whole fake it till you make it, you know, that expression I think is meant to be, um, not, a, not you're not supposed to fake your whole life, okay? You're supposed to sort of fake aspects of it. And I, I like to think of the example of say, somebody who has recently finished medical school and now has to go be the doctor that they've been training to be for whatever, 10 years that it takes to get to be a physician. And they are qualified to do the work that they're, that they're doing, but they lack the confidence, you know, that, that they will get eventually when they're seasoned in the job. So you fake the confidence, but you're not supposed to fake you know, your credentials. So Sophie, you know, things get a little blurry for her as she gets farther into her, her work, which is to, to work as a gallerist for this, um, this rising star in the gallery world called, named um, Benji Okoa. And she always needs to present this version of herself that she thinks fits the role that she has put herself in. And another complication for Sophie is that her, one of her very good friends from when they were young women is a, a sort of a Taylor Swift sort of superstar. And so she sees her, her friend Tanya's life, right, as a kind of what hers could have been if she had stayed on the track, you know, that she put herself on originally. And so she's 
sort of been deceiving herself, as we were talking about with your first question, deceiving herself about about the person that she has made herself into. Also, the social media aspect of this, I think, is a huge component, right? And we, even in our modest lives in comparison, we are always confronted with these images of someone else's seemingly ideal existence, their their beautiful home or their beautiful children or their beautiful self, right? <laughs> and and so what Instagram in particular, and I guess maybe TikTok too, I don't do TikTok, um, they compel us to present this this false image of ourselves. And so in, in that way, I hate to, to think that we're all on this track of sort of being encouraged uh, to fake everything. Uh, and that's that's obviously damaging. So maybe that's my next novel right there. Say. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I always call Facebook a highlight reel of people's yeah, lives. Yeah. But, but isn't it interesting how as human beings, there's a part of us that wants to be known. And then there's a part of us that's afraid to be known for who we truly are. Yeah, right. right. And we're afraid to be judged uh, and found wanting. Yeah. And your, your novel really played with those themes because anybody who wants to be a novelist, I think there's a part of you that wants to be known, but on your terms. I right. I, I was just talking to somebody um, who is not a writer and is not a public person in any regard. And the work she does is very much um, behind the scenes kind of work. And I was talking about my upcoming book tour and and she said, I just can't even imagine how you can go do that. And she knows me. She knows that I'm an introvert and a very private person in my day-to-day -day life. And I said, you know, what you learn to do is, you know, you, you, you become, you know, the author, right? Even right, right now today, I, here I am. I'm the author. You guys are the, the podcast hosts. But um, probably at least one of you still needs to, you know, clean your bathroom or, um, you know, the lawn needs to be cut or, you know, you had a fight with a kid earlier today or whatever, right? This is, we should talk about these things because that's, that's everybody's reality. That's right. Very normal. We all live normal lives. And the other thing that I, a little bit your story brought out and same as social media that I loved about these sisters is it's okay to be different. And sometimes as siblings, we deal with, but they're more successful, or mm -hmm. that one seems happier. Or I can't compete with this one. Mm -hmm. And there's something so precious in parenting or even friendship to be able to say to someone else, just be who you are. Don't, it's a beautiful thing and refreshing, truly, to everyone else around us, just to be you. And yeah. I think that's what I loved about these characters, like Claire, she's, she's happy to be the doctor, but sometimes Sophie thinks she should have had more of a professional career. It's so easy to compare ourselves. It is, it is. There's a conversation between, I think it's um, Claire and Beck when they are first meeting up in, in New York. Claire has come from where she lives in Minnesota and they're gonna start taking care of the business of their mother's, um, you know, their mother has just, just died and, and they have to clear out her apartment, right? Do all the things we have to do when, when we lose a parent. And they have this, this sort of, they're, they're not exactly fighting in this scene, but they're kind of picking on each other a little bit. You know, um, Claire keeps, keeps telling Beck, like, you know, don't you want a real job? Don't you want to, you know, have, have a real profession sort of like, like I do, you know? And we know that Claire, because we've seen Claire behind the scenes, we know that she's just as insecure. And so she, what she's doing, she's kind of projecting that onto her big sister. And um, these dynamics, they play out all the time in real sibling relationships. I don't have sisters. Do you guys have sisters, either one of you? I do. I have a sister who's nine years younger. And oh, it's yeah. an interesting dynamic because there's at times where I want to mother my sister. I bet. Actually growing up. And, uh, but it is wonderful having a sister. I have a brother and a sister, and I'm so fortunate in that respect. Yeah, I envy you for that. I always wished I had a sister too. I have sister-in-laws and they are like a sister to me. I, yeah. I just love them all. And honestly, my daughter is 32. She's becoming a daughter, but also a sister too, like a friend mm -hmm. sister too, as they get to be adults, right? And it's yeah. a beautiful thing. Yeah, I can see um, that. I want to talk a little bit about the other character 
that I really grew to love in this book. And I, but I can't say too much about him. I, I started thinking because I don't want to give any spoilers. But we have C.J. Reynolds, the ex-con, who comes into this main town. And uh, he is, um, we come to understand and empathize with him and ultimately root for him. Now, out of all the characters in the story, he is the least likely one that we might actually be rooting for because everyone else at first glance would seem to have their lives together. But here's an ex-con who had his whole life uprooted, turned upside down, and but something about him made me think sometimes c catastrophe in our life makes us realize what's important and what is not. Yeah. And I, I caught that in him. But... Um, Here's what I, s I thought. Sometimes as the reader, when I read this, I realized to myself, we can judge others too hastily. We hold so many facts against people mm -hmm. as if no one's allowed a mistake whatsoever. And this CJ had experienced our incarceration, um, and he was almost the opposite of the sisters, but he kept moving forward. And what I, my takeaways from him, and I just wanted to know... Um, if you knew anyone like this in your life or what inspired you to create such a character because his motto was sort of this reach for it go for it do it snag it don't <laughs> turn away and i kind of love that about him yeah yeah he's um cj is is our our outsider in this story and because we have the perspective of all of these other characters and we know that their lives behind the scenes are not so so well organized as they appear but we also have the perspective of cj who as you said is an ex-con and the one that that from the outside we would be judging most harshly right uh, and in fact he tr tries to kind of keep his his history a little bit Quiet. So he wants to just go to Maine and he wants to buy a house and, and he, he's a painter and he, you know, a fine artist and he wants to just have a quiet place to just do the thing that he loves most in his life. And I think of, of the characters like this. We have, you know, the sisters and their messy lives and um, Beck's husband, Paul, over here. And we have CJ on this side. And these guys, they're still kind of climbing that hill, trying to figure out really what's important to them and what they really ought to do with their with their lives and, and relationships. And then on the other side of the hill is CJ, who is, he's already, he's forged by fire. He has been through it all. He has figured it out. And now he's just like, he's focused. And he's, you know, he, he is actually like the catalyst for change in, you know, everybody else's situation. So that was a lot of fun to put that together. You asked if, if that was, you know, based on sort of personal experience or if there was a model for that. Um, in, in a lot of ways, that's me, actually. You know, and I mean, there's a little bit of me in, in every character I write, really in every book, even the ones that are based on real people. But in this case, my early life was was very messy. Both of my parents, when they split up, that was not a particular trauma for me. But then each of them went on to marry people who were just awful. They were just awful. My brothers were grown up and out of the house. So I was there living with my mom and my stepdad and he was uh, verbally abusive, emotionally abusive. It was just, it was a really difficult, ugly time for me. And so because that was how I was sort of grounded in my early adulthood, that influenced a lot of the decisions I made, you know, going forward from there. So eventually I figured it out. <laughs> I didn't have to go to prison for that to happen. <laughs> thank goodness. But I did eventually figure it out and get myself set on the path. And for the most part, um, I'm knocking on wood here. For the most part, it is, you know, I, I am manifesting the, the plan that I created for myself all years ago when I decided I wanted to do this this fiction writing thing. Yeah, isn't that amazing how adversity matures you in so many ways? And to me, mm. that is a great gift. It is. I talk to my kids about this all the time. Yeah, experienced some trauma, but they have had 
so much insight into their lives at a very young age that I think it makes them a different adult. Yeah, yeah, and I think what we want to convey to our kids, uh, and of course remember for ourselves, is that the path between the crisis and the good outcome that we are hoping for, it's not always a straight path and it's not always a fast one, but you know, it's okay, you know, to, to live through that is to, you know, grow as a person to also hope, you know, you don't make the same mistakes, you know, on the other side. Of course, we still sometimes make mistakes on the other side. <laughs> We listen. We've all. I mean, I don't think there's anyone or very few people that haven't endured some type of hardship throughout mm -hmm. our many years of life. And yeah. I think the key is what you're doing as a writer. You are taking these life experiences and into who you have become, and you are sharing them with everyone. And we, any we, Kristen and I say this all the time. People cannot relate no one can relate to a perfect person or a perfect character in a book. Right. We wanna see hurdles, brokenness, uh, overcoming, strengthening, because it gives all of us hope and it yeah. helps us to see a pathway for our own selves. And um, it's very clear that you did this here. I felt that there was mm -hmm. a lot of you in this story and thanks for sharing that. It was a beautiful oh, story. You. I agree with you completely that, um, I mean, I hope that it's beautiful. <laughs> the part I agree with is that, that people's lives are, are not perfect. And that as a reader, that's, that I don't want to see that. That's not interesting. The struggle is interesting. The, the person who has that messy, disastrous situation and, you know, sometimes they don't overcome it. Folks who read my previous novel, A Good Neighborhood, will, will know that um, some, some endings are tragic. Uh, we hope that won't be the case for ourselves in our lives, but in, in fiction, that too, I think can be um, educational and cathartic to read about. Uh, I know that there are readers out there who, when they pick up a book, they don't want to be challenged at all, you know, and sometimes that's me, you know, I'll turn on the TV and watch, you know, Ted Lasso or something, right, because <laughs> I'm, I want something light and I want something, you know, with just maybe just enough um, messiness, but I don't walk away from it worrying about Ted when the show's over. Um, but on the other hand, uh, did you all watch Fleabag? No, no, I have not seen it. It's just a two season um, sort of dramedy where things things are a little bit ugly and a little bit messy and, and there's some trauma in there. And I think, wow, oh, I really love that. I love that that there are stories that we can go to that represent the the grit in our lives because it does it does make us feel like we're we're connected as humans we we just said this on our last podcast we spoke with an author who had a movie that came out that got some criticism and Kristen and I said we fully endorsed it because it was gritty because mm. it was real life and we don't live in a Hallmark movie. And I love right. Hallmark at holiday season or whenever, but I want a real life story that yeah. I can relate to. And we, I completely agree with you there. I wanna ask you about an issue that I think a lot of people can relate to, but don't often talk about. And that is a relationship or a marriage where there's no passion or there's, no, uh, there's not a sexual relationship. One of your characters was experiencing this and I thought it was very interesting because she drew a lot of conclusions about why that was the case. And yeah. she wasn't exactly correct about certain things. She wasn't. Um, right? And had they communicated and talked about this more directly, it, it could have had a completely different outcome. And I was wondering if you have kind of ruminated on why people do not directly head on deal with some of these communication issues or some of the wondering that goes on in a marriage. Because I think it's true. For years yeah. and decades, people will wonder about something, but then allow life to get in the way and busyness. What, what are your thoughts on that? No, you're, you're right. So it's, it's fascinating to think about how when we enter into what's going to become that primary relationship in our life, um, we think like we are, we're marrying our best friend. You know, we've got this wonderful connection with this person. We're going to be so close, you know, always. And, and it's always going to be as wonderful and, and 
honest and, and clear as it looks on our wedding days. And doesn't turn out to be the case very often. I mean, I think it's a rare occasion where people have that kind of relationship all the way through. So in this book, you know, we have this long married couple, um, Beck and Paul, and they both have actually made some assumptions about each other based, at, you know, not out of malice and not even really completely mistaken, but rather they're sort of erring on the side of caution on both sides. And so to bring up the issues that they have between them, they both feel like would be a kind of an injustice or a disservice to the other. They don't, they don't want to hurt the other person. At least this is what they tell themselves. But I think that what is, is really happening under the surface in those situations is that they're operating out of fear. They're coming from a place of fear. They're afraid of what their, their partner will think of them. They're afraid of being wrong. They're afraid of being right. They're afraid of the consequences that may come if they raise the topic. And I think that's the biggest thing that holds us back. And I'm speaking from personal experience here too, in a past marriage, to, to say the truth, to raise the issues means the potential to upset the status quo. And when we are, especially like in our earlier marriages, when our kids are young, we don't want to disrupt things for our kids. We don't want to be judged by our families. You know, we don't want that stigma of a failed marriage if things don't go the way that we hope they will. And so really, I think we're just sort of terrified to talk about some of those thorny things. And then, as you said, um, it's, it's the, the day to day kind of allows us to suddenly, you know, see five years or in the rear view mirror and you think, well, I've lived with it this long, you know, and I have all these other things that are working just fine in my life. You know, my kids are happy. My parents are happy. You know, what I should be thankful, right? There's often that component. Um, count your blessings. Don't, don't focus on the negatives. Like all of those things can get in the way. In American culture, so I would say that there's a fair critique to be made that we are sometimes too focused on self-gratification. And so when you look at it from that perspective, you say, well, you know, how much should I really expect to have? Shouldn't I be thinking more about somebody else's feelings? And there's, so there's a lot of that happening in this relationship in the book too. But the other side of that is who are you, who are you really serving in the end if you don't address those problems that can't go away? on their own. If, if you really are, as was in, in my case, if you really are just, just not a good fit for each other. Um, some people have the, the good fortune that they grow together and you know, they marry early and they, they my, my brother and his wife, they got married on his 19th birthday. They're still together. It's been an excellent, I mean, had, it's had its bumps. They would certainly tell us that but they managed to sort of be on the same trajectory all the way through. Um, but I didn't have that experience. And so eventually I realized that, uh, that you have to pull the plug and then look for your own opportunities for happiness. Look for, um, you know, your, your ex, is, ex can look for their opportunities for happiness. Absolutely. I can identify with that. I've been through that. Okay. Well. Absolutely. And, you know, I think one of the secrets, I have a brother who has a longtime marriage to his, you know, high school sweetheart as well. Mm -hmm. but I've seen them grow together and evolve together because we all change as we, right, right, sure but they do. did in that, in that similar direction of that growth. It's beautiful. It is. Or to let people grow in their own way, but respect it and continue to support them because yeah. we're not the same person we were at 19. We're very different. And let's hope we're different. We yeah. don't want to be the same person. But no, exactly. I, yeah, I loved, um, I liked how uh, these this couple, uh, Beck and uh, Paul. Paul. Yeah, I did, I did like the fact that there was no terrible argument between them. You wove it just to show the reader so clearly that they just had grown apart. 
And yeah. maybe if there, even if there was communication, I don't even think it could have mended. I think they became such different people apart from each other. And my one takeaway from that was, as I get older, I realize life is so short. And I tell my kids all the time, I've, I have 28 nieces and nephews, and I tell them, don't settle for that yeah. job or that significant other. Life is very short. And you think you're going to be here forever, and you know mm -hmm. you can make another choice, but you can't. It's not true. It goes by really quickly, and okay. time is precious. Every year is precious. No, and the and the the fewer mistakes you can make at the front, <laughs> the better, right? Um, we we said earlier in the in the in our talk here that there are mistakes. There are always going to be mistakes, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't at least strive for the you know choosing well and choosing wisely in as much as we can. I have always tried to, and I, I am an optimistic person, so I don't spend a lot of time looking in the rear view mirror and um, you know, berating myself over those poor choices. I just try to treat everybody you know, with, with love and respect and honesty and say, you know, we're, we can't go backwards, right? As you said, time is short. We can only go forward. We don't know how much time we've got. And that's Marty at the, the front of our novel here. You know, she's she's on the clock and um, she is trying to, you know, impart some of her, her hard-earned wisdom to her daughters. And the way that we are all saying, we're trying to impart that to the young people in our lives. Mm -hmm. And then we could say, be like CJ Reynolds in the book. I, I feel that way. The ex-con <laughs> who just realizes, I'm just going to, I can't say everything that he did, but I love everything that he did at the end. You know, I don't <laughs> want to give anything away. <laughs> well, well, Therese, can you tell us what's on your radar? What are you working on now? Oh, give my gosh. Clue, or give us you know, a clue. I, maybe I should tell you all of the different things that I'm thinking I might write, and, and you can choose the one that I should write. I'm, I'm, I have a struggle between books often where I have a number of competing interests and ideas and I haven't quite yet landed on the one. Uh, so you just have to stay tuned. <laughs> well, that sounds wonderful because these <laughs> have been amazing. And we just want to say to our listeners, you are going to really love this uh, new novel by Therese Ann Fowler. We, Kristen and I, love books that make a difference, that inspire, that have the ability to change our lives or our outlook on something. And this is one of those books. And in the meantime, you can connect with Therese. You can find her on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or even on her website at Teresa Ann Fowler at WordPress.com. Thank you so much for joining us today, Therese. Thank such you. A, such a pleasure, guys. Thank you. You as well. So I love talking to Reese Ann Fowler about this book. You and I have waited for it for many months because we had the ARC, or Advanced Reader's Copy, and June f we, we are recording on June 1st. The book will air on June 7th, so our listeners will hear this on June 7th, but we've been waiting for June 1 for a long time. And what struck you... Oh, there are a lot of things we could talk about in this one, isn't there, Kristen? Oh, my goodness, yes. I always think when our authors log off that I, I could talk to them all day, right? They have so many interesting takes on things and a lot of wisdom there. Um, I really enjoyed that. And I have to say, there was one thing that we talked about that really struck me, and that is this idea of looking at your life and thinking, how did I get here? Do I belong here? Is this what I envisioned for myself, right? And... I've been looking at some of my old diaries going back to literally when I was like 10, 11 years old. And I had always wanted to be an attorney. That was what I had written. And it's just amazing how fast then 45 years or 40 years goes by. And I think a lot of people take stock at a time like that when you turn 50 or you turn 55 or 60 and you think, how did that happen? And, and is this where I'm supposed to be? Have you ever asked yourself that? Absolutely, because, you know, sometimes don't you ever say to yourself, if I could do it all over again, would I have gone for the same career? Or would I have chosen something different? And at the time, 
of our youth, in my youth in particular, I was a little belligerent and did not want to do what my parents recommended. So I chose business and writing and all this kind of stuff. But hindsight, boy, I think I'd like to be a nurse. I mean, but I think it's too late now for me to be a nurse. So it, it is funny. Now, the other thing is life takes us on paths that we did not intend. And it could be, it's the butterfly effect. Have you heard of that? Where one little minuscule choice changes your entire trajectory. You move to a different neighborhood. Now you have a whole different group of friends. You attend a different college. Now you have a whole different group of friends and maybe your future spouse. You take job A over job B. It changes the rest of your life in ways that are unseen. Not all of this is bad. Some of this is good. And maybe the key is, Take whatever you get dealt, but be savvy and aware of it and know that you can still reconfigure it. You know, that's a very good point. And I think there are pivotal um, occurrences in your life that really do set you on a trajectory. And it can change, but one of them is choosing a spouse or a significant other because that ends up having profound effects on your children, where you put roots down, and it could go in a million directions. We know that. Uh, or where your first job is. I think those are pivotal issues that we got to use a lot of care and attention as we choose them. And I, and I always try to tell that to you know my kids and, and to their friends, choose wisely because this does change the trajectory of your life. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but I love what Teresa said about m having made some mistakes. And so I have a lot of friends who yeah, have been in failed relationships, but I really applaud them for the courage to say, as the characters in this book, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to choose a different course. And so even if it's not a positive yes answer, a no answer is positive too because it sets you on a whole different path. And just so many deep issues in this book that for any of us who are getting older in years, great takeaways and great lookbacks. My other thing I wanted to talk about is this idea of siblings and how very different we are and how we can so easily compare ourselves to one another, sometimes offer each other advice we don't want or need, and uh, be competitive or, or resentful with each other. And we have, I have a lot of nieces and nephews. I only have one brother. Um, my husband has several brothers and sisters. And we all love each other, but there have been arguments and disagreements over the years, as there's going to be in any family. And hindsight, looking back, I think a lot of it did not even have to do with something that someone did to us. It was more some insecurity inside our own selves. And part of it is growing up in that family, the family of who's the favorite, who's getting the attention, and who has the best grades, and who has the best job. And there's so many uh, intricacies in the family unit that affect the sibling relationship. Did you find that growing up? Oh, yeah. And think about what you just said, too, because we have relationships with one another, relationships with parents. There's so many relationships just in a family of four or five. I mean, there's literally a permutation that you could mathematically figure out. I won't, I won't attempt any math here. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're English here, not math. <laughs> and, but when you think about it, everybody then has a unique experience associated with those um, aspects and those relationships. And my kids will mention something about their childhood, and the other one didn't have that experience. And it just blows my mind that we were all in the same family, but had a different response to something, a different perception of something. And it's very important that we validate those perceptions, right? Mm -hmm. I, I did this the other day to my daughter. She said something, and I was like, that wasn't like that. I would never <laughs> describe it like that. And she, you know, and she called me out on that. And that, that's one of the things I really liked about this book, the subtle relationship dynamics. And they did cause you to really think about that. Mm -hmm. And to be able to see things in that character that they didn't even see in themselves. I yes, like that yeah. too. Yes. Very yeah. much. So what's on your radar now, Kristen? What's your takeaway or what are you working on? Yeah, well, one of the things after reading this book that I've been thinking about is this idea of subtlety, right? Because this book really, you have to sit back and reflect and there are very subtle relationship dynamics that are going on here. And so I was thinking about that both in writing and also in relationships, these undercurrents that sometimes we ignore for years or decades. 
So that, that's really been on my mind all week. Mm-hmm. How about you? What's I, on your I radar? I love that. Well, I sort of, like I told Therese, I loved the character C.J. Reynolds. And I feel like every now and then in life, it's okay to get a little tunnel vision and to focus on your own career or your own passions. And lately, with this podcast and writing for both of us, um, I've had to drop out of a lot of social things that I might normally do. It doesn't mean forever, but it means temporarily. And I would tell my kids, you know, you're never too late to learn. And I would say, it's okay sometimes to take time for yourself, refocus on your goals. It's never too late to have a new dream. You know how that saying goes or to start a new chapter in your life. And um, so that's sort of my takeaway from this as well. So uh, leaving out you today with a little storm predictions to pique your interest, we're going to be interviewing Ellen Marie Wiseman and her book that's coming out in August called The Lost Girls of Willowbrook. We have Francine Rivers and The Ladies Mine Sarah McCoy with the new hit Mustique Island, and Kate White with the second husband. Now, as we say goodbye, I have to mention, if you love the song that we have, this, this fantastic uh, theme song for Bookstorm at our opening and our closing, we have to thank the band Good Caleb. Um, they actually wrote that song just for Bookstorm. And while we're thanking people, shout out to our incredibly talented sound engineer, the Mr. Mark Carey, who, thanks to him, you can see us on YouTube and you can hear us on the podcast. Mark, you want to say hi? I want to say hello and hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you very much for listening. Stay tuned. And remember, listeners, one of the best ways to brave the storm is to dive down deep into life-changing fiction.